For the next 30 minutes, we will explore the unexplained. From mysteries beyond our galaxy, to ghostly phenomena in our own backyard, we will dive into our psychic abilities and explore everything from conspiracies to the just plain weird. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. If the truth is out there, we will find it. But only by sheer accident. Hey! Welcome back to 30 Odd Minutes. How are you? I missed you. It's great to be back with you guys. How are you, oddballs? We be good. Yeah. Everybody's good? Yeah. Good? Have a good week Show off? Us your <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, man. I've, I've had a great week. I was on the Queen Mary last week uh, looking for ghosts in the bowel of that great old ship with all kinds of other folks. Saw some people who were fans of the show. Thank you. Hello to you folks who, uh, who I met out there. Thanks so much. But tonight we're going to be talking about something a little different, a topic we haven't covered before. We're talking crop circles. There's been over 10,000 reported crop circles so far in 29 different countries. 90% of them are from southern England. And that's why we've got such a great guest tonight. We've got a Brit. When in doubt, bring in the British. Uh, but we know we like, we, you guys like when we cover all kinds of subjects. Tonight's no different. And sometimes you don't have a lot of time. You want to cover just one thing, one time, real quick. And that's why we bring you, when in doubt, the one question interview. One question interview. 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 We're here with comedian Mike Brody, paranormal comedian. In the bathroom of the Mount Washington Hotel, Mike, this is your one question interview. Okay. The chicks dig bald guys. Do chicks dig bald guys? I think so. Um, yes, they specifically me. They dig me, but uh, it's like, you know how like when Michael Jordan was really good, Michael Jordan was really good, and then like he got better. That's kind of how I view myself. Like me with hair was Michael Jordan in like the early '90s, but then championship Michael Jordan, uh, and he won uh, six rings. Thank you. How much longer until that was going to get really, really awkward? When in doubt, you just go into the men's room if you really need to get that interview. We go to those lengths here at 30 odd minutes. No, nothing sacred, nobody's sacred, no doubt. We also got some email this week. Glad to get it. Thank you so much. Here's what it said. Hello and thank you for taking the time to read this. You're welcome. Recently I saw a very clear message appear on our television that may be proof that it is haunted. Haunted TV. I immediately grabbed my camera and took the shot you can see right here. Let's put this up. Get out, get out. There it is, right there on your TV. My goodness, maybe it is haunted. I want to see how you feel about this evidence. Quote, evidence. Uh, I have only experienced a few of your shows so far, but I really enjoy it and appreciate what you do. Thank you and keep up the good work. JD in Florida. JD, your television is definitely haunted. Take it from us, we're professionals. And uh, our only advice is to not watch anything but 30 odd minutes and you'll be safe. Thanks for writing in. All right, moving on. Let's get to crop circles. There's one behind me. We're standing in the air, hovering over this, this wonderful crop circle here in southern England. And our guest tonight is, is a great person to talk to, Freddie Silva. He first began researching crop circles in 1990, and his fascination with the subject has grown since then. And so his career in modern commerce has really plummeted. Happens to the best of us, we understand. He's one of the world's foremost experts on crop circles, sacred spaces, and consciousness. The best-selling author of Secrets in the Field, The Science and Mysticism of Crop, crop Circles. And he also wrote and directed uh, the DVD, Stairways to Heaven, The Practical Magic of Sacred Spaces. He's a, a lifelong student of this subject. He's been on the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, and live from our studios in his house in Portland, Maine. Everybody, please welcome Freddie Silva. Yeah! All right. Jeff. Hey. Hello, boys. How are you? I'm still getting over your title sequence. I've <laughs> That's one of the funniest things I've seen. Well, you know, uh, proof comes in, uh, some people have a really low threshold of proof. Some people have a really high. We have a low one here, and uh, we do have fun with this. Now, I want to start with a question, and I apologize ahead of time. I know you get asked this all the time, but what's your favorite Led Zeppelin album? Is it, say, this one? Oh. oh is that it? Is that your favorite Led Zeppelin album? <laughs> Actually, I like presents. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, oh, very good. Not many people know that one. Not many people know that one. And of course, Led Zeppelin Three, which is one of the most acoustic of Led Zeppelin albums, not many people talk about either. Okay. Uh, I mean, it does have the record song. 
Let me start with a new question. What's your favorite Led Zeppelin album cover? Is it that one? Oh, I like one? the one he just showed. Absolutely oh, love it. There yeah, it cool. is. All right. Excellent, excellent. Good stuff. <laughs> it's the box set. All right. Yeah, it was the box set. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for pointing it out. Hey, uh, I did forget. I apologize. Uh, folks, if you're watching live at 30oddminutes.com, if you have questions, you can go to our chat room. And these folks over here are oddballs. They will pass your questions along to, uh, to myself and to Freddie, and you can ask away. So thank you very much. Sorry, I forgot. We're a little out of practice, but we get through it, don't we? All right, hey, Freddie, let's start uh, at the beginning. How long have crop circles been around? Well, surprisingly enough, Jeff, uh, despite what we hear in the media, which is around about 1980, uh, there is actual evidence that goes all the way back to, oh, um, 15 centuries. Uh, we talk uh, about them in religious texts. And of course, back then, they weren't talking about crop circles. They're talking about the devil circles and the witch's rings and things like that. But actual hard proof goes all the way back to the 17th century, when uh, a gentleman called Robert Plott wrote in the Natural History of Staffordshire, which is a huge, huge book. Um, it talks about these geometric shapes that uh, are pressed in the tall crop, and uh, they are found first thing in the morning. And even went as far as to actually make drawings of them. He shows circles with circles with squares inside them. He talks about hexagrams surrounded by rings and things like that. And the, the most incredible thing is that at the time, uh, Plot thought that it was actually some kind of a natural phenomenon that was intelligently guided because he couldn't understand how nature could create these incredible shapes uh, all by itself. And he theorized at the time and he even drew uh, in the book that he thought that there was some kind of sound element associated with it. There were these, he drew these trumpets uh, that came out of the clouds and uh, something got projected from the sky and it uh, created these patterns in the tall grass. And uh, what I find very unusual about this is the fact that in, in the modern uh, era of the phenomenon and our research, it quite clearly shows that sound is actually very much involved and it actually can account for many of the unusual anomalies that we find in the genuine crop circles. So Mr. Plot, 300 years ahead of his time and way ahead of us as well. And are these things tied to sacred spaces? Is there, I mean, Southern England, of course, we've got Stonehenge down there, um, other sacred paths, things like that. Is there a connection? Oh, very much so, and it's actually one of the most important connections that they were trying to make. Uh, Southern Britain, uh, in fact, the whole of the British Isles happens to be host to some of the world's most incredible uh, sacred sites. They have, it's like a library of the planet there. There are thousands upon thousands of mounds, standing stones, dolmens, Stonehenge and Avery, of course. And wherever you go in Britain and you find the crop circle, you will always find that they are always referencing the local sacred sites, either by their positioning by their magnetic orientation, by the mere fact that they appear on the same magnetic flux lines as the ancient sacred sites. But the uncanny thing is that wherever you go around the world and you find the genuine crop circles, which are now found in 29 countries, uh, including South Africa, by the way, they always appear beside the ancient sacred sites. Uh, even here in North America, in Ohio, where we get uh, some genuine ones uh, every couple of years, they all seem to appear by the mounds and also by uh, the Serpent Mound in Ohio. So there is that referencing. And uh, once we started putting one and one together and looking at how the geometry is the same as the sacred sites, how they work with the same magnetic lines of the sites, we began to realize that these are basically the, the new temples that are appearing on the landscape. It's just that they're not made with stone. They're just made with oppressed plants. And what is it about sacred sites? I mean, is there... Is there an earth magnetism that draws us to these locations? Is there, you know, do, do humans make them sacred and other things are drawn in? Or is it the cart before the horse or the horse before the cart? You know what I mean? Oh, it's both. Uh, and I've okay. been looking at it for decades, trying to figure out what came first. And I think our ancestors had a clear understanding of how the universe works and how nature works. Um, they could see the magnetic lines of energy just like any good intuitive can. Uh, you can do it today. It's just like driving a car. Uh, you can teach yourself to do it. And if people had told me that I could do this, you know, 15 years ago, I, I would have called them nuts. And today I can do it too. It's just like it's an ability that you develop and we all have it. And part of the reason why the sacred sites are here is because they create a certain amount of pressure on the landscape 
which connects magnetic energy with water. Water is always there at the sacred sites, just as the crop circles always appear in the vicinity of uh, water and underground deposits. Um, there's the geometry, which creates certain uh, energetic properties, which gives the uh, temples, for example, in Egypt, uh, its definite and individual qualities. And uh, when the Russians found out about this many years ago, they actually tested people uh, by putting EEG devices on their heads and monitoring their brain waves. And they found that, indeed, in the sacred sites, the laws of physics are tuned ever so slightly differently to allow these places to become very thin with other levels of reality. In other words, the veil between the worlds is very, very thin. And you find that people's brainwave patterns go up 4,000% above normal waking state in ancient temples. And the uh, a crazy thing is that the same thing happens inside crop circles as well. So when people talk about having these extraordinary experiences and uh, visions and healings and uh, other uh, touching the other levels of reality, and I'm talking about left brain people here as well, like lawyers and accountants who usually don't talk like this, uh, then we can see how the two are basically are overlapping. We're being shown a very old technology. Uh, we're trying to basically being told that uh, we, we've been given an heirloom. It's time that we rediscover it. Excellent. Well, actually, we, we do have a question in our chat room. Uh, Sarah, what's going on over there? We do. We have one from Short Elvis. He wants to know why are crop circles always round? Are aliens just trying to show off? I mean, after all, we know that squares would actually be quite easier. Did you hear, did you hear that? <laughs> actually, that's a very good question. Uh, they are not round. Uh, they are ever so slightly elliptical. And if you ever catch one on a hill, the ellipse can be as much as 36 feet uh, different from one ra uh, diameter to the other. So that actually presents a huge problem for hoaxers because if you're going to go out and hoax something, you're going to put a pole in the center, you're going to get a piece of string, and you're going to try and create a perfect circle. Well, that's the problem. Uh, the real crop circles are slightly elliptical, uh, which presents all kinds of uh, problems for anyone trying to emulate it. Um, so they're also, incredibly enough, uh, not always round. For example, uh, the picture that you see in front of you, um, we have different areas which are also uh, straight lines, bent lines, uh, bent for a reason, I should add. And there's also one several years ago that was made entirely out of hexagons uh, from the air, from 500 feet in the air. You could swear blind that all the circles were actually circles. But when you look on the ground, they were made by little hexagons. Now, that's quite a visual illusion, very hard to achieve. Now, let's talk about this one. It's also the one behind us. The, uh, this is in uh, Barbary Castle in uh, England, right? The one that we were just oh, looking yes. at? Now, what's, what's the math here? You mentioned lines bent for a reason. Uh, what are we looking at mathematically? Oh, uh, you could do a whole show just on this one. And it's sure. not surprising that uh, this is the crop circle that galvanized the entire world uh, back in 1991 when people actually, and the press, were very much into this. They could not accept the fact that all of this was being done by people and the hoax angle was rarely considered. Now, if you look carefully at that picture, uh, one of the lines is actually bent. The one, let's yep. see, from my point of view, would be the bottom right-hand corner line. Sure. Now, people say, well, that's an error. Obviously, it's man-made. The hoax has obviously made an error. Well, that kink happens to have an angle of 19.47 degrees. And if you know your hyperdimensional mathematics, that's a very strategic angle. Which we don't. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> Which we do. OK, you do uh, good. I'm glad I do. Now, uh, I'll give you a very brief uh, background behind it. Um, when you actually take that picture and you stretch that line backwards and you start looking at that photograph as a three-dimensional shape, that line enables you to see that two-dimensional picture as a three-dimensional tetrahedron, okay. which is essentially a three-dimensional triangle. Now, what is important about the tetrahedron and 19.47 degrees is that when you take that a tetrahedron, which is a solid, and you circumscribe it within a sphere, where the points touch on the surface of the sphere, if that were a planet, it would touch exactly at 19.47 degrees of latitude. Now, that is very important because at 19.47 degrees of latitude on every planet in the solar system, you will find an upwelling of energy that emanates from the center of the planet, and it will manifest as the most active part of that planet. Here on Earth, by example, the most active spot on the face of the Earth is the Hawaiian volcano of Mauna, Le Mauna Kea, okay. which happens to be at 19.47 degrees. And you'll find the same on uh, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and also the dark spot on Uranus. So they're actually trying to show us and tell us about hyperdimensional uh, dynamics. Amazing. So, so what happens in 1980, where, you, where some people claim that the, this got started? But 
Are, are they starting to uh, come up in greater numbers in 1980, or what, what was the line in the sand? Uh, very much so. It seems as if uh, no one was really paying attention all of these years, all of these centuries. I mean, uh, farmers would see them. Uh, there were 80 eyewitnesses that talked about beams of light creating the crop circles as far back as 1890. Even policemen would see them. They talked uh, about them like that they were cosmic cookie cutters that came down, flattened the crop in 15 seconds or less. And all the eyewitnesses talked about exactly the same thing all the time. And... Um, Sometime around 1980, uh, the phenomenon came to the attention of a man called Pat Delgado, who unfortunately passed away only a couple of months ago. Wonderful human being. Ex-NASA engineer, he starts taking uh, an interest in the crop circles, and suddenly, once he begins to figure out what they are, the crop circles begin to react to him and the people around them. It's as if they're showing him a lesson, and the more he learns, and the more the people around him begin to learn, the more the circles begin to activate and extend the information and the lesson from year to year. That's when we realized the whole thing was very conscious. Once they got our attention, they never let go. Right, interesting. Well, let's, can we cycle through a couple more of these, uh, Andy, while we're talking? Uh, so, so these things are turning up, not just in South of England, but uh, you know, I, I know there's been some in the United States. You can see some of these patterns, I mean, you know, spider webs, various uh, shapes. These are intricate. These are not things that could be thrown together uh, in a short amount of time um, by, by a hoaxer, right? I mean, exactly. Right. I mean, it's uh, now, now. Now, what about? Let, let's talk just real quickly about Doug and Dave <laughs> <laughs> in England. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, we have to. Of course, we do. We have to present all do. sides here. Now, uh, Doug and Dave. For those who don't know, you may have seen some uh, some some footage um, where you, you saw some gentleman that would put a, a plank of wood with a, a piece of rope that would be attached from one side to the other, put the rope around their neck so they could step and walk and and crush as they went. Um, that's just one way to do this. What, what happened with Doug and Dave? How, how do they, are they a uh, thorn in your side or, or, or what? Uh, not really. I mean, people will believe what they want to believe. And if people want to believe what they presented, uh, I'll say this in parentheses, in the mainstream media, right. uh, then they're, that's not you know, us, they're by gonna the way. be... Uh, we are very much, not you. We are very much not the mainstream media. We're the <laughs> garage band, here. the garage band of the media is what we are. But please. <laughs> Um, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, if you go to the mainstream uh, bunch, uh, they're always going to give you a version of the truth. Now, we were very lucky that one of the researchers at the time happened to have contacts within British government. And what the British government, uh, people within the government told us, and specifically scientists working for the government, was that we shouldn't stick our reputations on the crop circle phenomenon because very shortly the uh, Ministry of Defence will be making a couple of men, local artists, the uh, makers of all the crop circles around the world, uh, which tells me and told all of us that the, uh, the government knew about these people and was setting up uh, people ahead of time. They are very brief, these two guys, and they basically unleashed them onto the world. And what a lot of people don't know is that when they did a press conference in Wiltshire to claim that they were the world's crop circle makers, they were given a lot of very unpleasant questions and things that had never been published about the phenomenon, and uh, they were not able to answer a single one of them. For example, uh, they claimed to have been active uh, throughout the, uh, the county of Hampshire, uh, where all the crop circles had appeared. Well, the truth is that most of the crop circles had appeared in the county of Wiltshire next door. So they couldn't account uh, who, uh, who made those. And then we, when we told them, well, if you made this one, then who made this exact other one on the same evening uh, you know, in another country? And they said, well, no, well, we didn't make that one either. And by the end of the uh, press conference, they actually weren't sure which ones they'd made and which ones they hadn't. Right. So the whole thing was a joke from the start. And, of course, they were at the Washington Post and uh, the Independent, who are, are very two high-end newspapers at the time, I quote the Washington Post. They said, I find it more easy to believe in little green men than this story that Doug and Dave created all the world's crop circles, end of quote. Right. So the whole thing was a sham right from the start. Excellent. Well, actually, Freddie, hang with us one second. We have to take a quick break. We're going to go to a, a live field report. We're going to see if our satellite link is up working. Fingers crossed. Uh, we're going out to Matt Moniz, who's live in the Hockamock Swamp. Matt, are you there? Hi, Jeff. I'm out here in the Hockamock Swamp, right where Jason Lorifus found his... Bigfoot uh, trackway. Um, there's still reports of Bigfoot still lurking in the area, so we have to remain careful and be vigilant that you know we're able to find them. Uh, but this is the spot where Jason allegedly found the track. We've been all up and down the area 
we've seen plenty of uh, good indication that a creature of this type could live here. Plenty of food sources, corn, berries, plenty of water, fish and fowl for it to, to eat. And uh, I definitely think that there is something to this. I can't prove it, nor can anybody really for that matter until we actually find a body. But uh, I think Jason may be on to something. Back to you, Jeff. Oh, that was live. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> the, uh, the live satellite uplink worked again. Uh, Whew. We're getting good with this technology <laughs> stuff, man. Nice job, everyone. Glad the technology works. This is out. very high end. Yes, right. We, that's, if we are nothing else, we are high end. <laughs> high end. Sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's why we do this show, so we can you all get the together. You enough to be around in the 60s, Jeff. <laughs> no, probably not. All right, well, so uh, you, you, show, uh, you sent me one, one image that I really want to show folks. This is the, uh, Andy, the, the bent wheat stem. Um, and this is how we tell the difference between a hoax and the real thing, right? There, there we go. Very much so. Uh, and it's one thing that uh, all the hoaxes obviously try to avoid as much as possible. And uh, this is something that even plant uh, biologists are hard pressed to explain how anything in nature could do this and also without any damage. And if you've been very lucky to have been in a genuine crop circle, as I have many times, uh, if you're the first person there, you'll see that the plants are actually hovering just above the soil, about an inch and a half above the soil. Uh, it almost feels like you're stepping on the, uh, the Sistine Chapel ceiling. It's so sacrilegious to walk on something that's so beautiful, elegant. Uh, all of the crop is flowing like water, and uh, there's absolutely no damage done to the crop whatsoever. So this is something uh, that, again, um, it's very hard to explain what we could be doing this. And it was one of the things that I started to do uh, was to look at sound to see if sound was responsible for doing something like this. And we actually did find uh, some interesting information that uh, when you actually work with infrasound and you apply several atmospheres of pressure to infrasound, you will create a pressure wave that actually is able to boil the water inside the stems of a plant it will actually boil the water in one nanosecond uh, and it makes the plant obviously uh, very hot. Uh, you'll find scorch marks uh, uh, at the ends of the plant and around the nodes as well. And as the water gets uh, boiled and it explodes out of the plant uh, and you'll find these little blow nodes in the, uh, in the stems as well, uh, the plants basically become very top heavy and they fall over like, uh, ooh, like, like molten glass and then they reharden at their base. So this made perfect sense as to what was happening on the ground. It was the kind of frequencies that uh, were involved that could actually do this to biological material. Right, and if, if you're stepping on these, these plants with a board, you're going to snap them. You're going to crush them, right? I mean, is that... Exactly. The okay. Yeah, so that's... Exactly. The Therein is the difference. Actually, we do have another question for you in the chat room. Sarah, what's going on? We do. They want to know if uh, you've done any scientific, um, like chemical analysis sort of tests, like say on the soil, inside crop circles versus the outside, and if there's any difference. I have. <laughs> Matt has. We'll get to him. Uh, Freddie, have you looked into that, the difference in the soil uh, inside the circle as opposed to right outside? Oh, very much so. Uh, one of the first things that becomes very obvious is the effect of infrasound, which creates a heating effect. And uh, as you know, it tends to rain once or twice in Britain during the year. Right. And uh, you'll find that when <laughs> you day. walk down these <laughs> and <laughs> when you walk down these fields along the tram lines, which are the tractor lines that the uh, the farmers use for spraying the crop. Um, your boots become caked in mud. In fact, you actually gain about four inches as you're walking up the field. Uh, it's a very tenacious soil. And incredibly, despite the uh, amount of overnight rain, what, what you find is that as soon as you cross the perimeter of a genuine circle, you can pick up the soil with your hands and you can blow it off your hand. It's absolutely bone dry. And that's one of the things that you notice in your genuine circles is this heating effect which has this tremendous capacity to make very wet soil dry immediately. Now, we've also taken soil samples uh, to laboratories. We've taken some to Dartmouth uh, College in New Hampshire, not too far from here. And we also sent them to UCLA. And they did blind experiments, compared them to control samples of soil. And they found in these two, both laboratories that the soil samples that came from crop circles, which they, uh, scientists did not know uh, where they'd come from, Compared to these uh, control samples that they were given, the crystalline structure of the soil has been altered to a noticeable degree. Uh, and also, they finally came to the conclusion that the only way you could change the crystalline structure of soil to the degree that they found under the microscope was to, one, 
put the soil for five miles under a small mountain range, subject it to an intense amount of heat for about, ooh, a second, about 1,500 degrees Celsius of heat, and also uh, extort a, 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 a huge amount of pressure on it, uh, which, of course, means it would have had to come from a, under a small mountain. So you can imagine their surprise when it was revealed that the soil didn't come from a, below a mountain. It, it was topsoil from a, a real crop circle. So that's hard science for you. Right, and so, so what are these things, let's, let's get to the, the nitty gritty here, what do these things possibly mean? Where are they coming from? Are they, I mean, there's, of course there's theories that space aliens are coming down and, and, and beaming these things. Are they, are they from out? Are they from within? Uh, what, what do you, what's... Uh, it's both. Okay. It's, uh, it was actually the hardest uh, chapter in my book to write because I had to validate a lot of this information. I mean, it's very hard to validate the unseen without making you look like you're nuts. Um, and believe me, when you've been living over there uh, as long as I had, and uh, my, my colleagues as well, looking at this uh, information and looking at the, uh, uh, the beams of light coming down, filming them, uh, watching the balls of light doing their own thing across the fields, talking to the farmers who saw the same thing, talking to police that saw the same beams and the balls of light, um, we came to the, the conclusion that we're talking with a, a force that is outside of the planet. It's a consciousness. You can communicate with it. We've had experiments where we can communicate and they communicate back. It's very benevolent, uh, very loving and guiding uh, for, to the most degree. Uh, and also, not only do we see the uh, input of energy coming into the Earth and watching uh, eyewitnesses literally seeing crop circles form in front of their eyes, but there have been cases also where farmers have talked about seeing the beams come down, rotate the crop, and nothing happens. Except for 24 hours later, they'll come back to inspect that area, and the crop circle is manifested. Now, we've noticed that the crop circles swirl either clockwise or counterclockwise. And it's interesting that the Russians also figured out that if you actually apply a clockwise motion of energy to any system, any organic system, you input energy. If you move the energy counterclockwise, you extract energy out of a living system. So it seems to me that we're dealing with two things. One, there's an input of energy that's intelligently guided from a source which so far has been mostly invisible. And two, there's also some kind of information that's fired into the magnetic grid of the Earth because all the genuine crop circles, and none of the hoaxes have been able to do this, all the crop circles, like ancient sacred sites, like the pyramids, like uh, Stonehenge, they all mark the crossing points of magnetic lines of the Earth's energy field. And it seems to me that there's also not just an encoding taking place of information and ideas, but the Earth is also firing back information on its own, uh, which goes back to the Gaia uh, hypothesis, that the Earth itself, too, is responding to this stimulation as well. Right. And, and so, first of all, they're, they're, they're beautiful. I mean, they're... And there must be math involved, right? I mean, we, I was an art minor, oh. so we, we know the <laughs> symmetry. It's five new mathematical theorems, first time since Euclid in 300 BC. Uh, that's quite something. Yeah, right. It's, I mean, there's, there's math involved. It, it's artistic. It's, it's, um, they're beautiful in so many ways. Uh, Andy, real quick, can we bring up number 12? Um, this, is, this one intrigued me. Um, whoop, nope, sorry, next one. This is, we're looking for a round way in England. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yes. Underneath power lines. Um, real quick, we only have about 30 seconds, but um, it, so, so if something's coming down from above, would the power lines have interfered? Or so does this make you think maybe it's coming from at least close to the surface? Uh, it's actually, we've had a lot of power outages whenever they hit to the power lines or the power lines go in the way. But what's amazing about this one is that I predicted this along with six other people, and none of those people knew I was doing this experiment. We knew what it was going to be and what it was going to look like, and that's one hell of an experiment in communicating uh, with this very, very benevolent force. Amazing stuff. Freddie, thank you so much for joining us. We're, we're just about out of time here. Really My appreciate pleasure. Yeah, appreciate all the images you sent and talking to us about a, an incredible subject. Uh, before we go, I did want to bring up uh, Matt Moniz, actually, uh, over here. Matt, you, uh, you had an experience in a crop circle back in the 90s, right? Uh, yeah, I did. I met a young lady on the train, and uh, we proceeded to do stuff that is normally done in crop circles in the middle of the night, as I'm sure we Freddie understands. <laughs> Freddie, I think our friend Matt here um, uh, had, had quite a good time in a crop circle. We've uh, uh, got, got the footage, and we're expecting a very large check from you, Matt. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Thanks. everybody, Good for research. joining us. We've run out of time, 30-odd minutes. And for all the oddballs here, thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Yeah.